Welcome once again, my fellow manipulators of digital fate. I'm Richie, this is Capricorn. Today we have the final spoiler video for spoiler season for the Magic the Gathering Foundations expansion. Uh, we have a couple of juicy rares and mythic rares to get to, but mostly we got hit with the common dump, so there are a ton of commons to get through. We're going to lightning round, just blitz through all of those commons super, super fast at the beginning of this video, and get into the real juicy stuff that I'm excited to talk about. Before we do that, please like the video if you wouldn't mind. It helps the video get out to so many more people, it helps the channel to grow, and I super appreciate it. And make sure you subscribe if you're new so you never miss an upload. Tons of crazy content on the way but let's dive right in first off we have the common cycle of dual lands that are going to be available in foundations and these are the lands that enter tapped and gain you one life when they enter so we have one for every single color pair we have blood fell caves blossoming sands dismal backwater jungle hollow rugged highlands scoured barrens swiftwater cliffs thornwood falls tranquil cove and wind scarred crag one thing I do want to point out about these really quick is life gain is an archetype within foundations. So if you're drafting this set or playing sealed, you might be going into some sort of a life gain style deck and these these lands can actually trigger some of your stuff. So they're much more useful than they appear at first glance depending on what you're drafting into. So pay attention to that. But next up, we've got the white cards. We're starting here with Armasaur Guide, one white and four for a 4-4 four, four dinosaur with vigilance. Whenever you attack with three or more creatures, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. Next up, we have Banishing Light, one white and two for an enchantment. When this enchantment enters, exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls until this enchantment leaves the battlefield. I like that this is going to be in foundations and sort of setting the bar for white removal for standard moving forward. So... That's pretty nice. But next up, we've got Cathar Commando. Love seeing this come back. A 3-1 human soldier with flash for one white and one. And you can pay one and sacrifice him to destroy target artifact or enchantment. I love using this guy in flash decks. He's sometimes really good in the sideboard, so I'm just super excited to see him here. Next up, we've got Dazzling Angel. One white and two for a 2-3 flying angel. And whenever another creature you control enters, you gain one life. This should actually be pretty good and limited because it's got evasion, it doesn't cost too much, and it gives you that little bit of supplemental life gain to, life gain to help uh, win races and stuff like that. Next up we've got Fleeting Flight, one white for an instant, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature, it gains flying until end of turn, prevent all combat damage that would be dealt to it this turn. Nice little trick for combat for sure. Next up we've got Hair Apparent. One white and one for a 2-2 Rabbit Noble. When this creature enters, create a number of 1-1 one, one White Rabbit creature tokens equal to the number of other creatures you control named Hair Apparent. And a deck can have any number of cards named Hair Apparent. Now, this is actually a pretty cool card. Not only is it a rabbit, and we just got Bloomborough, where Rabbit Tribal is actually a thing and that could matter. But there is a card that we spoiled yesterday that's 4 mana, 2 white and 2, and returns all... Two mana or two mana or less uh, mana cost creatures from your graveyard to the battlefield. So I could see a world in which we're self milling like 17 of these guys into the graveyard and just casting that, and then they all trigger each other when they enter and create an, a metric ton of 1 1 tokens. Is it too cute? Is it a meme? Maybe, but I think we're gonna try it. Next up, we've got Healer's Hawk, one white for a 1 1 flying lifelinking bird. This should be kind of decent in the life gain decks, although we do have a bat that already kind of does this, so I don't know how redundant it might be. Next up, we've got Inspiring Paladin, a 3-3 human knight for one white and two. During your turn, this creature has first strike. Also during your turn, creatures you control with plus one plus one counters on them have first strike as well. So depending on how deep the plus one plus one counter strategy goes in limited, this guy could be a really, really solid turn three play. But next up, we've got Luminous Rebuke, one white and four for an instant. It costs three less to cast if it targets a tapped creature, and you destroy target creatures. So just a baseline, you know, setting expectations for removal. This is, this is your floor, you know. Five mana instant speed kill anything, or two mana instant speed kill, kill a tapped creature. 
Next up, we've got Make Your Move, one white and two for an instant, destroys an artifact, enchantment, or creature with power four or greater. This is definitely your staple sideboard card in draft that you bring in if you're up against the right kind of uh, permanents that you need to whack. Next up, we've got Squad Rallier. This is one white and three for a three, four human scout. And you can pay one white and two, look at the top four cards of your library, reveal a creature card with power two or less from among them, and put it into your hand, put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. This is actually pretty decent and limited because when you run out of gas, you've got this mana sink and you can just keep powering up. That being said, you are going to want to be playing in the right archetype that's going really wide with power two creatures so that you always have the, the consistency of making sure you hit something if you do use this guy. Because if you pay three mana and whiff, it's not going to feel good. Next up, we've got Vanguard Seraph, one white and three for a 3-3 three, three flying angel warrior. And whenever you gain life for the first time each turn, surveil one. This could be a nice filler card at the four mana slot for any of the life gain decks. But honestly, just a 3-3 three, three flyer for four is pretty decent and limited anyway. So I could see this showing up in other decks as well. Next up, we've got blue cards, the first of which is Aegis Turtle. One blue mana for a 0-5 turtle. That's it. Cowabunga. Moving on, next up we've got Big Fin Bouncer, 1 blue and 3 for a 3-2 Shark Pirate. When this creature enters, you return target creature and opponent controls to its owner's hand, so nice little bit of extra value tacked in there, mostly meant for limited. Next up we've got Elementalist Adept, 1 blue and 1 for a 2-1 Human Wizard with both Flash and Prowess. This is one of the better commons we've seen for sure. It's going to be the backbone of any kind of non-creature spell prowess style limited deck. And I actually think this card has a chance to hit constructed play in standard. Uh, Flash means you can make sure your guy survives to get all of the prowess triggers when swinging in the next turn. Uh, you know, by flashing it in after after they're tapped out or, or whatnot. So... I actually kind of like this. I don't necessarily think it's definitely going to make the cut in standard, but I think the potential is actually there for this card. Next up, we have Mocking Sprite. One blue and two for a 2-1 Fairy Rogue with flying. And instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast. This will be pretty decent and limited in the right deck, especially if you're really big into instants and sorceries for like the prowess cards like the last one we just saw. Next up, we've got Run Away Together. One blue and one for an instant. Choose two target creatures controlled by different players. Return those creatures to their owner's hands. This card is great if you have a lot of creatures with ETB abilities so that you can gas back up while also setting your opponent back. So nice, should be pretty good and limited. Next up, we've got Strix Lookout. One blue and one for a one two bird with flying and vigilance. Can also pay two mana and tap it, draw a card, then discard a card. A lot of versatility here. I think the thing I like about this the most is that it counts as a bird, so it's possible this could see play alongside other bird synergies, but pretty decent and limited as well. Next up, we've got Uncharted Voyage. One white, sorry, one blue and three for an instant. Target creature's owner puts it on their choice of the top or bottom of their library. It's a weird way of wording that. That's definitely a wording change for sure. Um, but you also get to surveil one and this is at instant speed, so this is nice as sort of setting the bar for what blue removal looks like at the common rarity in, you know, a foundational set, pardon the pun, like foundations. But next up we've got Witness Protection, one blue mana for an enchantment aura, enchants a creature, enchanted creature loses all abilities and is a green and white citizen creature with base power and toughness 1-1 one, one, named Legitimate Business Person. The fact that you can turn creatures into legitimate business persons in the base set, the foundation set for Magic the Gathering, I find kind of funny. Let's move on. We're, we're on to black now. This is bacon to a pie, two black and two for an instant. Destroy target creature, create a food token. You know, your standard, typical, kind of over-costed removal for limited, but it's still going to fill that slot decently well. Next up, we've got Burglar Rat. One black and one for a 1-1 one, one rat, and when it enters, each opponent discards a card. We have a lot of variations of this card available in standard, uh, available... Man, this this is this has been reprinted as, as functional reprints so many different times, but cool to see Burglar Rat in the base set here. Next up, we've got Fake Your Own Death. One black and one for an instant. Until end of turn, target creature gets plus two plus oh. 
and gains when this creature dies, return it to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control, and you create a treasure token. I think it's pretty interesting that they chose this version of this sort of ability as like the foundational version to include in the foundation set, uh, getting the treasure token, getting the plus two power, and that sort of thing, it being two mana and not one like some of the other functionally similar versions of cards uh, of a card like this. Um, but this, this should be pretty cool. Next up, we've got Gutless Plunderer, a 2-2 Skeleton Pirate with Death Touch for 1 black and 2, but it also has a raid ability, so when this creature enters, if you attacked this turn, you look at the top 3 cards of your library, you may put one of those cards back on top of your library, put the rest into your graveyard. This should be pretty decent and limited, especially because of the Death Touch, a little bit of extra value you get off raid. What I think is really fun about this card is it works kind of decently well with Corpses of the Lost, because you can get haste on the Gutless Plunderer uh, to make sure you get to attack and trigger the raid. And then if you do trigger the raid, you're putting something into your graveyard so that you can descend and put the Corpses of the Lost back into your hand to get more value off playing it again another turn. So that's kind of cool. I don't know if it's actually good enough to make the cut in a standard skeleton deck, but um, it's worth exploring at least. Next up, we've got Infernal Vessel. One black and two for a 2-1 Human Cleric. When this creature dies, if it wasn't a demon, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control with two plus one plus one counters on it. It's a demon in addition to its other types. Uh, I actually really like this card. It's below rate at first, a 2-1 for three, but then it comes back as a 4-3. A 2-1 that trades with their two drop that then comes back as a 4-3 seems pretty decent. It gets counters, so it works with like plus one plus one counter synergies. Uh, I don't know, everything about this card seems cool. It also works with Unholy Annex, right? You get this into play, they might not even know you're running Annex, and then later on it comes back as a demon, and aha, I've got Annex, and now I'm draining for two at the end of every turn. That seems like it could be cool too. I think there's potential for this to see play in Standard. I don't think it's likely, uh, but there is definitely a little bit of exploring that could be done there, and there, there's a little bit of potential. Next up, we've got Infestation Sage, one black for a 1-1 elf warlock, and when this creature dies, create a 1-1 black and green insect creature token with flying. This card's awesome. We've seen similar cards like this in the past, a 1-1 that when it dies gets you another 1-1, but the fact that the 1-1 you get after it dies has flying makes this better than most versions of cards like this we've seen in the past. I actually really, really like it. I think this might be a a contender for being in some kind of a sacrifice deck in standard. I think it might be that good. It's definitely going to be great and limited. Uh, being able to have your chump blocker or, or something like that and then get a little bit of, a, of an evasive threat after it dies is super nice. But next up we've got Macabre Waltz. One black and one for a sorcery. Return up to two target creature cards from your graveyard to your hand, then discard a card. Nothing super crazy here, just like them setting the baseline expectation for new players on what effects like this look like. Next up we've got Marauding Blight Priest, 1 black and 2 for a 3-2 Vampire Cleric. Whenever you gain life, each opponent loses 1 life. This works really well with the 5 drop Mythic Vampire that we saw a couple videos, uh, a couple videos ago. If you guys haven't seen all of the other spoilers. I'm going to link all of the other uh, spoiler season days, the videos that I have for those in the description and in the comments. You can check those out because there's some pretty crazy cards. But uh, we saw a mythic vampire for five mana that whenever you your opponent loses life, you gain that much life. So if you have something like this out, it creates an infinite loop with that that just wins you the game, which is kind of insane. So like seeing this come back, um, a lot of versatility, a lot of potential for life gain decks moving forward. But next up we've got Pilfer, this is one black and one for a sorcery, target opponent reveals their hand, you choose a non-land card from it, that player discards that card. Again, just setting a baseline expectation for newer players on what abilities and effects like this are going to look like. Next up, we've got Sanguine Siphoner, one black and one for a 1-3 Vampire Warlock. Whenever this creature attacks, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. So even more life gain triggers here for the, the life gain style decks. Uh, it should be pretty a pretty good contender in Limited, honestly. We're starting to see so much support for life gain in Limited, and that's exciting to me. 
But next up, we've got Soul Shackled Zombie. This is one black and three for a 4-2 zombie. When this creature enters, you exile up to two target cards from a single graveyard. If at least one creature card was exiled this way, each opponent loses two life and you gain two life. So you get to exile two cards from your opponent's graveyard that might be problematic, might contribute to threshold, might have flashback, that sort of thing. And if one of them's a creature, you also get to drain for two on top of your four power body for four. That actually seems pretty good for, for a common for limited. And it even has a relevant creature type being a zombie. So you can do some interesting things with like zombie tribal. Uh, I actually think this card's gonna be pretty good in limited. But next up we've got Stab, one black mana for an instant, target creature gets minus two, minus two until end of turn. This is kind of like a shock, it really is your baseline one mana removal spell for black, but what I like about this is it gets around indestructible, right? If you've got a 2-2 indestructible guy, this will just kill it even though it has indestructible, and that's pretty cool. Next up we've got Vampire Soul Caller, one black and four for a 3-2 vampire warlock with flying, it can't block, and when this creature enters, return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. That's actually really good. We've come a long ways since the days of Gravedigger. Uh, for one extra mana here than what Gravedigger used to be, you get an extra point of power and flying. And granted, the creature can't block, and that's a pretty big downside, but your 2-2 Gravedigger wasn't doing a whole lot on blocks anyway, so I think having a 3-power flying threat instead is actually better overall. So I don't think this sees a ton of play, but I do think it's a pretty decent pick for being like your top end as a way to have some card advantage and also a, a flying win condition. But next up we've got the red cards, first of which is Axe Guard Cavalry. A 2-2 Dwarf Berserker for 1 red and 1, and you can tap it to give target creature haste until end of turn. Gonna be pretty good and limited. Next up we've got Courageous Goblin, 1 red and 1 for a 2-2 Goblin. Whenever this creature attacks while you control a creature with power 4 or greater, this creature gets plus 1 plus 0 and gains menace until end of turn. So it's just a 2-2, but as soon as you have something big enough out, now it's a 3-2 menace swinging in every turn that still only costs you 2 mana, which is kind of nice. Next up we've got Crackling Cyclops, 1 red and 2 for a 0-4 Cyclops Wizard. And whenever you cast a non-creature spell, this creature gets plus 3 plus 0 until end of turn. So another solid pick for limited prowess style decks where you're just going wide with a bunch of instants and sorceries that you can cast. Although it doesn't need to be instants and sorceries, right? It can be any non-creatures, so artifacts, enchantments, all that stuff is going to trigger the Cyclops. Should be pretty decent in those decks. Next up we have Fanatical Firebrand, 1 red for a 1-1 one, one goblin pirate with haste and you can tap and sacrifice him to deal one damage to any target. This is sort of the new uh, baseline expectation for a Mog Fanatic style card. Uh, having the 1-1 haste is nice. Having the versatility of being able to ping something later on, do one last damage to your opponent's Planeswalker to take it off, off the board, uh, make them not be able to reduce their Planeswalker to one loyalty or else you kill it, like that kind of stuff is pretty cool. I like this card a lot. Next up we've got Firebrand Archer, 1 red and 1 for a 2-1 human archer, and whenever you cast a non-creature spell, it deals 1 damage to each opponent. So, another good card for that limited archetype, the prowess non-creature spell style deck. Next up we've got Goblin Borders, 1 red and 2 for a 3-2 goblin pirate with raid. So this creature enters with a plus one plus one counter on it if you attack this turn. This should actually be pretty decent in aggressive limited decks. If you're just swinging every turn, going super wide with really cheap creatures, it's very easy to make sure you're consistently playing this on turn three as a four three. Uh, and that's pretty decent when it's just a common. But next up we've got Goblin Surprise. One red and two for an instant and you get to choose one. You can either create two 1-1 one, one red goblin creature tokens, which is normally what you're going to be doing, especially if you use this on curve, or later in the game, you can give creatures you control plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. Use it as a combat trick, maybe alpha strike, take out the opponent. The versatility is nice. But next, we have Gorehorn Raider. This is a 4-4 four, four minotaur, uh, minotaur pirate for 1 red and 4. It has the raid ability, so when this creature enters, if you attack this turn, this creature deals 2 damage to any target. 
This is sort of like a poor man's Flame Tongue Kavu. Cost 5 mana, you get a pretty decent body as a 4-4, you get to kill something with 2 toughness when it enters, or if you don't have anything to kill, you can at least do 2 damage to the opponent's head, and that's not nothing. Uh, in the right deck where you're consistently swinging a lot, this could be okay as a 1 of at the top end. Next up we've got Incinerating Blast, 1 red and 4 for a sorcery, deals 6 damage to target creature, you may discard a card, and if you do, draw a card. So we have some pretty expensive removal, but it can take out almost anything, and get you a little bit of extra value in the process. Next up we've got Involuntary Employment, 1 red and 3 for a sorcery, gain control of target creature until end of turn, untap that creature, it gains haste until end of turn, and create a treasure token. Uh, I kind of like this, it's... I don't like that the baseline threat and effect that's going to be in the foundation set is 4 mana instead of 3. That's kind of a bummer. But you do get a treasure token. So it's almost like you're paying the extra mana to get an extra mana back. And that extra mana back could fuel sacrifice synergies or artifact synergies or just mana fix you in a multicolor deck. So there's a little bit of versatility here. I don't, I don't hate it. Next up we've got Sower of Chaos, 1 red and 3 for a 4-3 Devil, and you can pay 1 red and 2 to make it so target creature can't block this turn. The one thing I really like about this is the fact that you don't have to only use this ability once. If you're really late in the game and you are out of gas and you've got a wide board and you just need to get through for the win, you could activate this multiple times and then you know, make it so that half half their board can't block and then you can get in for the win. And that's pretty decent on the back of a four power creature that costs you four mana anyway. Uh, de decent common filler. Next up, we've got Spitfire Legac. One red and three for a three, four lizard with a landfall ability. Whenever a land you control enters, this creature deals one damage to each opponent. Uh, I wonder how that's going to line up with Lizard Tribal right now, because there's already a lot of ways in Lizard Tribal to just directly ping for damage. Adding in another way to do that off of Landfall via another Lizard uh, actually seems kind of interesting and at least worth exploring. It probably won't be quite good enough for Standard, but uh, I do think something like that would be worth messing around with and, and trying out. Next up, we've got Sure Strike. This is one red and one for an instant. Target creature gets plus three, plus O, oh, and first strike until end of turn. Again, this is just setting that baseline expectation for spells and abilities like this and what new players can expect from stuff like this moving forward. Next up, we've got Thrill of Possibility. One red and one for an instant. As an additional cost to cast this spell, discard a card, and then draw two cards. And now we're on to green. Ambush Wolf, 1 green and 2 for a 4-2 wolf with flash, which is honestly already pretty decent. And when this creature enters, you get to exile up to one target card from a graveyard, which again, can shut down stuff like flashback or, or keep your opponent away from getting to threshold and stuff like that. So I actually think this one's pretty good. The flash could make this really, really awesome in just the right deck. So I think this is good, 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 uh, a good one for limited. But next up, we've got Apothecary Stomper, a 4-4 Elephant with Vigilance for 2 green and 4. And when this creature enters, you get to choose one. You either gain 4 life, or you put 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on target creature you control. Now, what's cool about that is you can actually choose the Stomper itself if you need to. So even if your opponent wiped the board and then this comes down, you can still choose the 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters. And this will just come into play as a 6-6 six, six Vigilance, which is not nothing. Honestly, but if you're trying to kind of come back against an aggro deck Maybe that life gain matters or maybe you're in the life gain deck and the triggers you're gonna get off that life matters So it's nice having the versatility But next up we've got beast kin ranger one green and two for a three three elf ranger with trample Honestly already pretty on rate for just a common Whenever another creature you control enters, this creature gets plus one plus oh until end of turn. So, nice ability that triggers there, especially for go wide decks. The more creatures you play, the bigger it swings in for, and it's always got the trample no matter what, so it can get the most out of those buffs. But next up, we've got Broken Wings. Pretty staple sideboard card here. One green and two for an instant. Destroy target artifact, enchantment, or creature with flying. You're going to pick this up later on in the draft, stick it in your sideboard, and against certain decks, bring this in to help shut them down. Next, we have Bushwhack. This is one green for a sorcery. 
and you get to choose one. Either search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle, or target creature you control fights target creature you don't control. I love that you're able to get fixing and ramp sort of in your removal slot without having to be one less removal card because it, it kind of does whatever you need in the situation. So I like seeing this one come come into the uh, to the limited format specifically. But next up we have Cackling Prowler, one green and three for a 4-3 Hyena Rogue with Ward 2. It has the Morbid ability, so at the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, you put a plus one, plus one counter on this creature. I really like this. A 4-3 Ward 2 for 4 is already pretty good for a common. And then the fact that literally every single turn that a creature dies, every single one of your turns that a creature dies, it's just going to keep getting bigger. I think that's great for a common. Play it. Play it limited. But next up, we've got Dwynen's Elite. One green and one for a 2-2 Elf Warrior. When this creature enters, if you control another elf, create a 1-1 one, one green elf warrior creature token. That's not bad. Uh, it makes me hopeful that elf tribal is going to be good enough in limited. It should be, right, as one of the baseline archetypes. Uh, this could really help give you some pretty decent value. Next up, we've got Gnarlid Colony. One green and one for a 2-2 two, two beast with kicker of one green and two. Clearly, this card is sort of meant to introduce newer players to the kicker, the concept of kicker. Uh, if this creature was kicked, it enters with two plus one plus one counters on it, and each creature you control with a plus one plus one counter on it has trample. So it's either a 2-2 two, two for two, or it's a 4-4 four, four trampler for five that also gives some of your other creatures trample. And the versatility there is really nice. But next up, we've got Grow from the Ashes. Uh, another way to fix and ramp, this is one green and two for a sorcery. You search your library for a basic land card and put it onto the battlefield and then shuffle. But it also has kicker two, so you can pay an extra two colorless mana. And if this spell was kicked, instead search your library for two basic land cards and put them onto the battlefield and then shuffle. Most of the time you're just going to use this to search for one to color fix you for that color you don't have mana for yet in limited. Um, but it's nice that when you top deck something like this later in the game and you have a bunch of mana going unused, you can just kick it, get a little bit of extra value, thin out your deck. Next up, we've got Treetop Snare Spinner. One green and three for a 1-4 spider with reach, death touch, and the ability to pay one green and two to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control, but activate only as a sorcery. Here we have Wary Thespian. One green and one for a 3-1 cat druid. When this creature enters or dies, you surveil one. Seems pretty decent. And now we're on to the artifacts. First up, we've got Campus Guide. Two mana for a 2-1 artifact creature golem. When this creature enters, you may search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, shuffle, and put that card on top. So again, a colorless way to mana fix uh, and help you get the colors that you need in limited, which is nice. We've also got Gleaming Barrier here, 2 mana for a 0-4 artifact creature wall with Defender, but whenever this creature dies, you get to create a treasure token, so pretty good. Uh, I kind of like it for, for the right decks. Uh, maybe Sacrifice decks could use this to stave off aggro earlier, and then just sack it to get value later on, and also get a treasure token in the process. Next up, we've got Gold Vein Pick, 2 mana for an artifact equipment. It equips for 1 mana. Equipped creature gets plus one plus one, and whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, create a treasure token. This is sort of another way of giving you colorless fixing in limited, a way to get the colors that you're missing to cast some of your spells, while not completely wasting a card for only doing that, right? You still have a little bit of extra value here in that it can buff your creature up, and if it dies, you just re-equip it for just one mana, make the next creature a little bit bigger, which is nice. And then next up, we've got Quick Draw Katana. Two mana for an artifact equipment. It equips for two mana. And during your turn, equipped creature gets plus two plus O oh, and has first strike. An equip two plus two plus O oh, first strike is actually pretty decent for a common. And it can always turn one, one of your creatures into a valuable threat. The one downside is it's only during your turn. So you're never going to be able to block super effectively well so you probably only want to use this in very aggressive decks and that's it for the common artifacts but we do have one common land here to, to go over other than the duels that we already talked about and that's evolving wilds coming back taps sacrifice the land search your library for a basic land put it onto the battlefield tap and then shuffle 
This will be an important card in Limited to draft if you're in three colors, which I don't even know if three color is going to be viable in Limited in Foundations, but if it is, this is going to be a very, very important part of those decks. So you're going to want to pick it pretty high. And that brings us finally to the juicy stuff. Let's get into it. Good Fortune Unicorn, a 2-2 Unicorn uh, for 3 mana in the colors of Selesnya, so 1 white, 1 green, and 1. And whenever another creature you control enters, you put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on that creature. This is nuts because you can use it with token creatures as well. You can have ways of making a bunch of creatures without spending mana necessarily, and all of them are entering with plus 1, plus 1 counters. All of them get to trigger your plus 1, plus 1 counter synergies. Uh, it does require... Um, going deep into that kind of an archetype to really get the most out of this, and otherwise, this might be a little bit overcosted if you're not deep enough into those synergies. But in the right decks, I could see this being pretty insane. Uh, next up, we've got Burnished Heart coming back. Three mana for a 2-2 artifact creature Elk, and you can pay, th uh, pay three and sacrifice this creature. Search your library for up to two basic land cards, put them onto the battlefield tup uh, tapped, Man, I can't speak today. Put them onto the battlefield tapped and then shuffle. So, nice little bit of value here in that you can potentially block with this to prevent losing even more life on, on your opponent's attack. And then in response, sacrifice it, get some value. It helps fixes you. It's a colorless way to help fix you uh, and helps you, helps you ramp because it puts them onto the battlefield. So... This is actually a really good card and way better than it looks on the on the surface. And it's always been a pretty good pick in Limited, so pay attention to this one. But next up, we've got Revenge of the Rats. Two black and two for a sorcery. Create a tapped 1-1 one, one black rat creature token for each creature card in your graveyard. And then it also has flashback for two black and two. Uh, this could be really interesting in Rat Tribal, which is actually a very powerful deck in Standard right now. And kind of flying under the radar. I think what I like most about this card, though, is the idea of maybe self-milling it into our graveyard and just getting free value because of the flashback cost. Um, that, that concept really, really kind of lights a fire under my ass when it comes to, you know, thinking about ways to, to brew with some of these cards. So this one should be pretty cool. Next up, we've got Eager Truffle Snout. This is one green and two for a 4-2 boar with Trample. And whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, create a food token. Now, this is another one that's kind of just meant for limited, but it's going to be really good there. Honestly, 3 mana 4-2 with Trample is nothing to scoff at. If you get to even make one food token, then this guy was totally worth it. So, should be pretty good in those decks. Next up, we've got Stromkirk Blood Thief. One black and two for a 2-2 Vampire Rogue. At the beginning of your end step, if an opponent lost life this turn, you put a plus one plus one counter on target vampire you control. Uh, pretty interesting. I wonder how deep Vampire Tribal goes in this set. I haven't really been paying attention to that as a tribal mechanic, but now that I think about it, thinking back to all the other spoiler videos I've made, there have been a decent amount of vampires, so... I think Vampire Tribal might actually be a relevant archetype within Limited, and that's pretty exciting. This guy could be pretty cool there. Next up, we've got Quake Strider Ceratops, an uncommon 12-8 dinosaur for 3 green and 3. Yeah, it's expensive. Yeah, it's vanilla, but it's an uncommon. That's a 12-8. That's just kind of awesome. I like that this set, this is in this set specifically for newer players to see like what green is capable of uh i feel like that'll be a real wow moment for a new player to see next up we've got mischievous pup one white and two for a three one dog with flash reminds me of bandit when this creature enters you return up to one other target permanent you control to its owner's hand it's up to one. So worst case scenario, you can still flash this in just as a 3-1 creature at the end of your opponent's turn or while your opponent's attacking to block their 3-3 and blow them out. But also, you can return something. You can return something with an ETB ability that's going to get you extra value off replaying it. Um, you could return something in response to them trying to kill it with their removal to save it so that you can recast it later. There's a lot of versatility with a card like this, so I kind of love it. I like seeing it here. It's going to be fun to try and use this in Limited. 
But next up, we've got Felling Blow. One green and two for a sorcery. Put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. Then that creature deals damage equal to its power to target creature and opponent controls. Uh, pretty decent bite spell. Obviously, this is meant to sort of set the bar for newer players to for their expectations concerning how removal looks in green. Uh, but it's uncommon for a reason. Gives you extra value, makes your creature a little bit bigger, kills their creature. It's not a fight spell, so you don't have to put your creature at risk. It's a pretty good card. Next up, we've got Resolute Reinforcements. One white and one for a 1-1 one, one human soldier with flash. And when this creature enters, you create a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token. This card's amazing. Uh, it's super good in standard right now in Convoke style decks, getting two bodies for one card, being able to flash it in so that you dodge potential sorcery speed removal and that sort of thing, or surprise your opponent with a, a surprise blocker. Lots of versatility with this card, lots of cool stuff you can do, and I think it's going to be really, really good and limited. But next up, we've got Snakeskin Veil. One green mana for an instant, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control, it gains hexproof until end of turn. This card is a staple for sure. I love that this is in the foundation set so that newer players get accustomed to this sort of mechanic. Uh, just giving your guy hexproof, saving them from target removal at instant speed for one mana is awesome. But then getting rewarded for doing that by getting an extra plus one plus one counter that sticks forever that makes your guy even better. Not only did they fail to kill your dude, but your dude got better. And that's going to feel real bad for your opponent. Uh, and feel really good for you. Next up, we've got Brazen Scourge. This is a 3-3 Gremlin with haste for 2 red and 1. Uh, seems pretty good. 3-3 three, three haste for 3. In the very, very aggressive limited decks, this guy is going to be awesome alongside the rest of the stuff that you're playing. So, I also like that it's kind of a Gremlin. Can we start getting more Gremlin Tribal? We have a couple of Gremlin payoffs in Duskmorn, but they're really pretty thin. Uh, I would really love if, if Gremlin Tribal could get a lot more support, a lot more love, and become a thing, because I think it would be really fun. Next up, we have Garrick's Uprising. One green and two for an enchantment. When this enchantment enters, if you control a creature with power four or greater, you get to draw a card. Uh, so if you play it at just the right time, it replaces itself, which is nice. Gives all creatures you control trample no matter what. No stipulations, no hoops to jump through. They just get trample. And also, whenever a creature you control with power 4 or greater enters, you draw a card. So, this kind of dodges a lot of that feel bad. Like, you don't feel bad if your power 4 creatures are already on the battlefield, because if so, when you play it, you get to draw a card. But you also don't feel bad playing this early when you don't have a power 4 creature on the, on the board, thinking that you missed out off that card draw, because all of your power 4 creatures are going to draw you cards when you play them later. So... That makes this card way more playable, and you can kind of play it anywhere on the curve that you need to, and then just get your value off of it whenever you get your value off of it, which is really nice. Next, we have Frenzied Goblin, a 1-1 Goblin Berserker for just one red mana, and whenever this creature attacks, you may pay one red. If you do, target creature can't block this turn. I actually really like this ability. I think it's just the right decks. It could be super powerful, making their best creature unable to block every single turn for the price of just one red mana if you're in the right deck going wide with a ton of attackers could be hugely detrimental uh if you're against a deck that plays a lot less creatures and focuses on the quality of those creatures you can completely shut that down <laughs> uh so seems really cool gives me a little bit more hope that maybe goblin tribal decks could be a thing in standard Next, we've got Ravenous Amulet, two mana for an artifact. You can pay one mana, tap it, and sack a creature, draw a card, and put a soul counter on this artifact, but activate only as a sorcery. So, can't do it in response to removal. Still a nice way to get some value in a sacrifice-style deck. Draw a card, sacrifice a thing that you want to sacrifice anyway, and then also has an ability to pay for, tap, and sacrifice this artifact. Each opponent loses life equal to the number of soul counters on this artifact. So it just builds up soul counters, builds up soul counters, and eventually, if you get to the point where you have more soul counters than your opponent's life, you just go, oh, wait, I can just sack the amulet and win. Cool. So it, it doubles as an alternate win condition, which is kind of awesome. Um, yeah, I love that about this card. The, the focus is on the first ability. In certain decks, you're going to get way more value off that, like decks you want to sacrifice stuff. Uh, and then out of nowhere, sometimes it can just win the game for you. That seems great. 
Next up, we've got Dauntless Veteran. One, uh, two white and one for a 2-2 human soldier. And whenever this creature attacks, creatures you control get plus one, plus one until end of turn. This isn't super great, but it should be decent in certain limited decks that are going super wide, especially if you also have a way to kind of buff this guy up and make him a bit better on the attack, make sure he can survive the attack so you can keep getting triggers every turn. Should be okay. A little bit expensive, though. And next up, we've got Vampire Nighthawk. Two black and one for a 2-3 Vampire Shaman with flying and death touch and lifelink. This guy is awesome. He's been a staple whenever he's in standard of some kind of deck. So I'm excited to see if there's some sort of a standard deck that actually uses this to great degree. Maybe in the life gain deck, maybe in a vampire tribal deck. I don't know. We're going to have to wait and see what kind of standard decks actually end up being viable. Uh, but this guy could potentially show up there. Going to be amazing and limited. This is like a first pickable limited card. Snag it. It does everything you want. Evasive win condition. Trades with their better creature because of death touch. Get you life to help win the race against other aggro decks. This card is just amazing. Grab it, play it in limited. But that's going to bring us to our rares and mythics. Finally, let's do it. First up, we've got Sky Knight Squire. This is one white and one for a 1-1 one, one cat scout. And whenever another creature you control enters, you put a plus one plus one counter on this creature. And as long as this creature has three or more plus one plus one counters on it, it has flying and is a knight in addition to its other types. Uh, I kind of love this. I love that it's a cat. So this could be a staple part of the cat tribal deck, especially because the cat tribal theme wants to go super wide with cats anyway. So if you're jamming this on two, there's a lot of potential for you to get like three tokens on turn three, uh, or maybe one, one actual creature card and two tokens or something like that. Immediately put three counters on this, turn it into a four, four flyer and swing in. The potential is there because we can go super wide with super cheap cats, right? Um, so, I don't know. This seems awesome to me. I love that it becomes a knight as well. I don't think you necessarily try to run this in knight tribal or anything like that. But flavorfully, I really like that it becomes a knight. Uh, yeah, I just, I just like this. I like that we're getting more support and the potential for cat tribal to actually be a thing that's viable in standard is going up every time, every time we see a card like this spoiled. So, love that this card exists. We'll have to see if it ac actually ends up being good enough. But next up, we've got Loot, Exuberant Explorer. That's right, Loot is back in Loot's second card ever. This is a 1-4 Legendary Beast Noble for 1 green and 2. You may play an additional land on each of your turns. And then for 6 mana and tapping him, you can look at the top 6 cards of your library, reveal a creature card with mana value less than or equal to the number of lands you control from among them and put it onto the battlefield. Put the rest on the bottom in a random order. My mind immediately goes to the domain ramp decks that try to ramp up to an Atraxa that are kind of everywhere on the ranked ladder right now. Uh, this might see play there, letting you double land drop every turn, ramp up way quicker, and then eventually like, oh, you don't have your Atraxa in your hand? Just pay six, tap it, as long as you have seven lands out, find an Atraxa in the top six and jam it. Um, that's kind of how I see it fitting into standard, the, mo the most likely way it fits into standard. Uh, that being said, I don't know if this card actually makes the cut in that deck because there are so many good cards in standard right now. The card pool is so insane. It's, it's really hard to tell without testing it if this ends up being good enough. It might be too slow. It might just die to a cut down the turn that you play it. It might feel super bad, right? Maybe they kill it right before you get to the 6 mana, you never get to use the ability. Sure, you got to maybe ramp an extra land once or twice, but I don't know. It's it's hard to say. I guess the one really good thing about this that I like about it is you can play it on 3, immediately play another land, and immediately have 1 mana, maybe to hold up a protection spell for loot, or to play some other 1 drop. And I like that about this. And a Apparently the dog's excited about this card too because he is howling up a storm. Hey bandit, you like you like loot? Is he your best friend? No, I'm not talking about like Destiny or Borderlands. I'm talking about the card. Okay, I, I like to pretend that he talks to me. Leave me alone. The next card we have is a mythic, our first mythic today. I know it's a mythic. 
Right of the Dragon Caller. Two red and four for an enchantment. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, create a 5-5 red dragon creature token with flying. This has me a little bit scared because my gut reaction, my gut instinct tells me this is just too expensive. By the time you can get this out and then untap with your mana and still have instants and sorceries to cast, the game is probably over. But the other side of the coin to that is combo decks, right? And I am terrified. We've seen a couple cards now, one already in standard, one coming to standard in this set that allow you to storm off. Uh, and bring the storm ability into standard and that is terrifying the thought of that with something like this is is absolutely terrifying so I don't know is there some kind of a combo deck that's going to be able to make use of this card and just create a bunch of 5-5 dragons out of nowhere a little sooner than what it seems like you might be able to with how expensive this card is if you have ideas, definitely let me know in the comments, because I, I have to feel like there's some kind of potential for a combo deck to just go absolutely insane with this card, and I'm super scared about that existing. But like I said, at the same time, I do feel like it's a bit expensive, and if you try to just play it fairly, uh, it's probably too little too late. And that brings us to our last card of the day, and our last card at all for the Foundation set. This is Rise of the Dark Realms. Well, technically not our last card. I'll get, I'll get to that in a minute. There are other cards we need to spoil. Really, really insane cards that we need to spoil. But there is a caveat to that. So I'll talk about that in just a second when we finish up here. But Rise of the Dark Realms is 2 black and 7 for a sorcery. Put all creature cards from all graveyards onto the battlefield under your control. This is way too expensive. <laughs> this is super expensive. But if you can ramp up to it, you just take everything and just win i guess so i don't know maybe there's potential for this to actually work in standard but i think what this is meant for this is meant to be one of those cards that attracts commander players to the set because even though foundationally this set is mainly meant to be sort of the the support pillars for the standard environment uh, they're obviously going to put in enough cards into this set to attract players from other formats as well. And this is one that's going to be really nuts in Commander because you're playing with a bunch of players, right? A multiplayer format. So you get to put even more cards onto the battlefield under your control because you pull all of the creature cards from all of the players you're up against. So that seems pretty nuts. That being said, if you can think of a way this is actually usable and not too expensive in standard, definitely let me know in the comments because it would be super fun if it could be consistent enough and not too expensive and too cute. Uh, but I don't know. Let me know if you have an idea. But that brings us to the end of today's video. That being said, the caveat that I talked about earlier. There is a foundation starter set that's coming that brings a ton of crazy rare reprints to standard and we didn't go over any of that stuff in any of the spoiler videos so far because they're technically not a part of the base set they're not going to appear in the boosters they're not going to be a part of draft or sealed or any of the limited environments they are a separate thing that are that is a starter set but believe me when i tell you the cards in the starter set are absolutely nuts and are going to completely change the face of standard. So many crazy, ridiculous, old standard archetypes that have been dead for a few years are coming back through cards in this starter set. Uh, and it's mind-boggling to see the power level and just, just some of the craziness that I thought was out of standard forever coming back and rearing its ugly head again so a lot of craziness still to go over that video will be coming asap so look forward to that if you haven't liked the video already please please like this video it helps me so much helps me get out the video to so many more people because the algorithm is picky as hell and you have to you have to massage it and treat it well and uh give it a happy ending and all that good stuff so help me out with a like subscribe if you're new so you don't miss any of my uploads tons of crazy deck techs on the way as well and make sure to catch me live monday through friday over on twitch that's twitch.tv slash quarantine capricorn because if i'm alive and i'm breathing i'm there and i'm streaming unless i'm making these videos for youtube which is important so we did the thing 
I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Wonders of the First. Wonders of the First is a brand new collectible card game similar to games like Magic the Gathering, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon, featuring a unique action-based resource economy that helps avoid pitfalls like Mana Flood or Mana Screw, and a battlefield containing multiple realms that unlock over time as you fight for control of the stones. The first 400 card set is called Existence and will launch to retail in the fall, but playtest team starter kits are available to order now. And they haven't forgotten about all you collectors out there. The game contains alternate borderless art variants, as well as highly sought after limited edition numbered prints, culminating in a one of one stone foil. And the best part is that the developers have a community first approach, with eight print and play decks available on their website, as well as a version of the game available on Tabletop Simulator, all for free. For more information, be sure to check out WondersCCG.com today. That's Wonders ccg.com Thanks so much for checking out my channel. I'd like to give a huge shout out to all of my patrons over at Patreon. Without you guys, this channel would not be possible. So honestly, thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of your contributions. If you haven't yet, like and subscribe. The more likes we get and the quicker we get them, the bigger this channel will grow and the faster it will grow. I'd love nothing more than this channel to become something very special for you guys, but it's entirely up to you how fast that happens. Also, if you'd like more deck text, that's somewhere over there. And if you'd like to see what else the channel's been up to lately, that's somewhere up that way. Also, subscribe, circle below, do all the things.